Thank you for viewing this morning's sermon by Pastor Mark. But first, a message from Pastor Tim. Shelly and I are on vacation, but we will be home tomorrow. But because of what's going on in the world, I felt like I needed to talk to you for a couple of minutes today. You see, it's at moments like this, when the world needs to see the difference that Christ makes in our lives, when the world is going through the valley of the shadows of trouble. According to David, when he wrote Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd, I shall not want. And at verse four, he says, we walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. One translation says, the valley of the shadows of trouble. I will fear no evil. I want you to understand, those are definitive statements that David makes. Those are not indecisive questions. If the Lord is our shepherd, I will be made to lie down in green pastures. If the Lord is my shepherd, I will find rest. If the Lord is my shepherd, I will not be afraid. You see, it's this relationship with Christ that makes all the difference in the world. It's at moments like this that our faith will deepen or our fears will mount. And remember, faith is a gift from God that he gives to us very freely. But fear is a tool of the devil and he wields it fiercely. I was reminded this week that we have brothers and sisters in other countries that we will probably never meet this side of heaven, who every single week, week they have a faith pandemic. In other words, if they gather together as a church, they run a risk of arrest, imprisonment, and even death. They don't practice social distancing in the midst of that faith pandemic. We need to be very careful about not distancing ourselves from each other. Faith can be risky business. So here at New Hope, we're not going to forsake the assemblies of ourselves together. Oh yes, we will be cautious, we won't be presumptuous. We will do normal practices that we ought to use all the time anyway. Proper hygiene. If you're sick, please stay home. If you're in one of those categories that are high risk, please stay home. If your immune system is down, take all the extra precautions. Yesterday here at New Hope on our work day, we had people putting up hand cleaning stations before you go into any building to make that more accessible for you right now. They've sterilized all the surfaces and all the door handles so it will be as safe as we possibly can make it. Practices you should be doing at home as well. We're going to do best practices, but we're going to do what's reasonable, not what is fearful. We're also going to be investigating over the next several days what other things we as a church family need to do to make it best for each of you. If you are elderly or if you live alone or if you don't have family close by and you need a call every couple of days from somebody here at New Hope to see how you're doing, if you get sick and don't have anybody to reach out to, please call the church office. Call my own personal number. If you don't have it already, you can call the office and get it or I'm gonna give it to you right now. It's 559-281-0175. And if you have an emergency, don't hesitate to use that number. We're also investigating how to expand our online worship services. And we're also going to be talking to families who may be challenged because school has been discontinued for a few weeks. And if that's going to create a hardship on, on working parents, then we're gonna see what we can do to maybe help out in the meantime. So please, be mindful, be prayerful, but remember, we have no reason to fear what this world can do to us when we know that the Lord is our shepherd. God bless you. Have a great worship day. Mark's got a wonderful sermon ready for you. And now let's join Pastor Mark with a sermon from our Road to Recovery sermon series. So quick question, a pop quiz. Who was it that gave the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus, Jesus good. Yeah. <laughs> that was an easy one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that was it, just one question. You'll, I'll explain why in a minute. But uh, <laughs> So addressing the National Seminar of the Southern Baptist Leaders, George Gallup said, we find there is very little difference in ethical behavior between churchgoers and those that are not active religiously. The levels of lying, cheating, and stealing are remarkably similar in both groups. A Gallup poll said that 8 out of 10 Americans consider themselves Christians, but only about half of them could identify the person who gave the Sermon on the Mount. Fewer still could recall 5 out of the 10 commandments, and only 2 in 10 said they'd be willing to suffer in any way for their faith. 
Many years ago in a Moscow theater, matinee idol Alexander Rostovsev was converted while playing the role of Jesus in a sacrilegious play called Christ in a Tuxedo. He was supposed to read two verses from the Sermon on the Mount, remove his gown and cry out, give me my tuxedo and my top hat. But as he read the words, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they should be comforted. He just began to tremble. And instead of following the script, he just kept reading from Matthew 5, ignoring the coughs and the calls and the stamp, the foot stomping from his fellow cast members. It was as if he was in a completely different world. A world where it was just him and the Bible that he was holding in his hands. Blessed are the merciful, for they should obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Rostovsev continued reading the entirety of the Beatitudes before he reverently closed his Bible. Then he made a statement that he could remember from his youth in the Russian Orthodox Church. And he said, Lord, remember me when I come into your kingdom. Needless to say, the whole rhythm of the rest of the play was completely thrown off, but the actors and actresses managed to pull off this matinee performance nevertheless. But for the rest of his life, Alexander would claim that this was the moment when he was playing the part of Jesus in a sacrilegious play that he placed his trust in the Lord Jesus as his saviour and he was born again into the family of God. 2,000 years ago, Jesus went up onto the hillside and he sat down and he preached the most memorable sermon ever given. He preached the Sermon on the Mount. And when he started that famous saying, I want your life to be blessed, he gave eight principles that would bring happiness to our lives. And these are the eight principles called the Beatitudes. And we've been in a series for a while now with the road to recovery and it's about overcoming your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups that have totally messed up your life or are beginning to mess up your life. And when you look at the Beatitudes Jesus gave 2,000 years ago, you discover that there's a summary of steps. And those steps are the road to recovery. And as we close this series today, I want you to see all the biblical basis behind what we've been talking about for the last couple of months. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. That's step one. Realize I am not God and I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing in my life and my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know that they're spiritually poor, poor, that they know they don't have the power to make the changes in their life that they need to make, but that God can make those changes for them. Then there's happy are those who can mourn for they shall be comforted. They don't have the power to change, but don't worry. God's going to comfort them. He will give us the power to change. And that's step two. Earnestly believe that God exists and that you matter to him and that he has the power to help us recover. And then there's happy are the meek. Meekness means under control. Meekness does not mean weak. Just because it rhymes with weak doesn't mean it is weak. It means strength under control. A stallion that's been broken and tamed still has the same amount of strength than when it was before it was broken and tamed. And it's called a meek horse at that point. It's strength under control. And that's step three. Consciously commit to, cho- to commit all my life and my will to Christ's care and control. That's what meekness is all about. If you take that step, you're meek. You have strength, but you're under control. Then there's happy are the pure in heart. Step four is openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and another person I trust. In order to have a clear conscience, in order to have a pure heart, you've got to take out the garbage. You've got to throw out the trash. And then there's happy are those who desire, whose desire is to hunger and thirst for what God requires. And that's step five. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove all my character defects. And then we see two verses in the Beatitudes about relationships. Happy are the merciful to people that have hurt me and happy are the peacemakers to people that I've hurt. And that's step six. Reevaluate all of my relationships. Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends to them where I've, uh, where I've done harm to others except when to do so would create harm to them or others. Last week we looked at what's called the maintenance step. It's a step that keeps you on all the other steps. 
And that's step seven. Reserving daily time with God for self-examination, for Bible reading, and for prayer in order to know that God had in order to know God's will for our lives and also gain the power to fulfill God's will for our lives. This week, as we wind up this series, we'll look at the last step. And the word we've been looking at is recovery. The final letter is Y. And Y stands for yield. Yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others both by my example and by my words. God wants to use your experiences to help other people. He wants to use us. He wants to recycle our pain in our life to benefit other people. Usually we think that God only uses the really gifted, the really talented people. But that's not true. God uses ordinary people. We usually think, God, use my strength. But then God says, I I don't want to use your strength. I want to use your weaknesses. People are helped By our strengths, sure. When we have strengths and we help other people, it helps them immensely. But sometimes people are helped more when Christ shows strength through our weaknesses. When you share your strength, people go, okay, no big deal. I'll never have that strength. But when you share your weaknesses, they say, okay, I can relate to that. I understand that. As you share from hurts, habits, and hang-ups that you're recovering from, God wants to use you, and that's what step eight is all about. Yield myself to be used by God to bring his good news to others. And when you understand this, when God uses our weaknesses and our pain, it takes on a whole new meaning in life. When we begin to practice this step, when we get to step eight, and we begin to step out in step eight and say, okay, we have the good news and we want to share it, that's when you begin to have genuine recovery. The proof of recovery is when you begin to focus outside of yourself instead of internally. You stop being so self-absorbed. We stop saying things about our own needs, our own hurts, and our own problems, and we start saying, okay, how can I help other people? The proof of recovery is that you want to help others and that you want to stop focusing on what's going on in in your own life and your own hurts. So to wrap up this series, we'll do two things. The first is that we're going to talk about why has God allowed our pain? It's a big question. Why has God allowed our pain? And the second is, how can we use our pain to help other people? So first, why has God allowed our pain? Well, there's a lot of different reasons and a lot of different circumstances, but we'll go through four today. The first one is that he has given us free will. He's given us a choice. Genesis says, you were made in the image of God. How are we like God? Because he gave us a choice. We can choose good, we can choose bad. Right or wrong. Life or evil. And God says, you can reject me or you can accept me. It's your choice. Why? Because God doesn't want a whole bunch of puppets. He could have made it where we have no free will at all. He could have made it so every day we bow down to him three times a day without fail. And everything that we do is good. We don't do anything bad. But God wanted his people to love him voluntarily. You can't say that you love somebody until you've had the opportunity to not love them. You can't do a good thing until you've had the opportunity to do a bad thing. You can't have one without the other. So God has given us the free will and he's given us free choice. And free will is not just a blessing, because it truly is a blessing, but it can also be a burden. Because sometimes we make really dumb decisions. Sometimes the choices that we make, our free will choices, are not that good. And dumb choices that we make can have all kinds of painful consequences, not just to ourselves, but to others. And it's good that I am free and that I can choose, but it's bad Because often we choose the wrong thing and it creates pain in our lives. I can choose to experiment with drugs, but if I get addicted, that's my own fault. I can choose to be sexually promiscuous, but if I get a disease, that's my own fault. God says, yes, I would not like for you to have all this pain, but it's kind of the package deal. It comes with free will. Not only does God give you free will, he gives it to everybody else as well. And sometimes they don't do the right thing and you end up getting hurt in the process. 
Those of you that have been hurt deeply by a parent, a former spouse, a teacher, a friend, a relative, yes, God could have prevented all of that hurt. He could have stopped it. He could have taken away all the free will of that person to do the wrong thing. But you know what happens in that situation? To be fair, God would have to take away our free will too. You can't just take it away from one person without the other. It's a real dilemma. And the problem by having having free will as a blessing is that we also get the burden, but God says, I will not overrule your will. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose to go there by rejecting everything that he does. He says, I love you, and I want you to be part of my family. But if we say, forget it, if we thumb our nose and we walk away and close the door, we only have one person to blame, ourselves. That's free will. The second reason, he also uses it to get our attention. God uses pain to get our attention. Pain is a warning light. It's a buzzer, an alarm. It says, it's time to do something. Something is wrong. Pain is not your problem. The depression or the anxiety or the fear is not actually the problem. It's just a warning light that tells you there is a much bigger problem in your life. It's a symptom of the problem. If the check engine light goes on in your car, the light is not the problem. It's the engine. So it's God's megaphone. He whispers to us when we're in our pleasures, but he yells at us when we're in our pain. He says, wake up. Something is wrong. God yells at us in our pain. Proverbs 20.30 says, sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. In other words, sometimes things have to get really bad before we start to change. Pain gets us going sometimes. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, Paul says, I'm glad not because it hurts you, but because the pain turns you to God. It got your attention. So the pain turns us to God. People like Chuck Colson or even Joe Avila, who's, who's in our church, prison is something that happened to them. But God used that experience through them. He used them to provide other services, other hope, for other prisoners. He uses pain to get our attention. If you remember the story of Jonah, Jonah was going one way and God kind of wanted him to go the other way, so he provided a sort of not-so-typical Mediterranean cruise, and at the bottom of the ocean, (laughs) Jonah 2.7 says, when I had lost all hope, there was no more hope, when I had lost all hope, I once again turned my thoughts to the Lord. Isn't that a great verse? When I've lost all hope, then once again, only then, do I turn my thoughts back to the Lord? When David was running from Saul, he went from place to place, gradually losing all his support system. He lost power and position in, in uh, Saul's court. He lost his wife. He lost Samuel, his advisor. He lost Jonathan, his best friend. And finally, he lost his self-respect. And at that point, he was low. He was feeling down. And Psalm 142 talks about this time period. It says, I cry out loud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way in the path where I walk. People have hidden a snare for me. Look and see. There is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Let me free from this prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather around me because of your goodness to me. I cry to you, Lord. He says, "All all is lost. Nothing is left. No one is here. I cry to you, Lord. Only then do I cry to you. And in these situations, we can look vertically or we can look horizontally. We can look to other people. We can look to things that give us comfort. We can look to drugs. We can look to alcohol, pornography, dysfunctional relationships, whatever it is that is our comfort zone. Or in these moments, we can look vertically. We can look up to God. Which brings me to point number three. God uses pain to teach me how to depend on him. Paul's example, 2 Corinthians 8 it says, we were crushed and overwhelmed and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God who would save us. And he did help us. You don't know that God is all you need until God is all you have. 
You don't know when things are falling apart and things are lost and everything seems to be crumbling. You don't know that God is all you need until you realize he's all you got. And he is all you need. And if you never have a problem, which is highly unlikely, you never know that God can actually solve these problems for you. So problems can be a good thing. God allows pain to teach us to depend on him. And again, David writes in Psalm 119, it is the best thing that could have happened to me, for it taught me to pay attention to your laws. The best thing that could have happened to him. The truth is, some things we only learn through pain. It's the only way to learn. Pain can be one of life's greatest teachers. The fourth reason is that God allows us, or gives us the opportunity to use pain to minister to other people. God allows pain in our life to prepare us for ministry. It makes me humble. It makes me sympathetic. It makes me sensitive to others' needs. We begin to understand other people's pain. And this is what step eight is all about. Yield myself to God to help other people. Because the truth is, pain prepares you to serve. 2 Corinthians 1, 4 says, Why does God do this? So that when others are in trouble and needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them the same help and encouragement and comfort that God gives us. Everybody needs recovery of some kind. Everybody has some kind of issue. Whether it's mental, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, social, or relational. We all have some kind of hurts, habits, or hang-ups. Nobody's perfect. But who better to help an alcoholic than somebody who's battled alcoholism? Who can better help somebody dealing with the pain of abuse than somebody who's been abused? Who can better help someone who's lost a job and gone through bankruptcy than somebody who's lost a job and gone through bankruptcy? Who can, who can better help a parent of a child who's out of control than a parent that had a child that was out of control? God wants us to recycle the pain in our life to help others. But we've got to be open about it. We've got to be honest about it. If you keep hurt to yourself, then we're just wasting it. James 1, it says in verse 4, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The process of going through the pain develops, us, develops in us something taught. We then have the experience that we can share with others. That's why James started by saying that we should consider it great joy when we go through trials. That's a tough verse to swallow. We should consider it great joy when we go through trials. But ultimately, trials are a tough training ground. They provide around us battle-hardened people who can pour into others who need that experience. You can support people, but sometimes they need the experience behind it as well to give them the extra information. If you're a soldier going into battle, who would you want training you? Somebody who's read a lot of books about tactics, or would you want someone who's been there, who's come back, maybe a little beaten up, but they've been through it. They have the experience. That's the kind of people you need to train you. The Fernandez family who are here today, we baptized them on Thursday, the whole family. They've been through a lot in the last four years. Their daughter passed away four years ago this week. It was their wedding anniversary. It was also the anniversary of her death. So baptism seemed to add just something a little better for that day. But the last four years, they've walked through it with God. Powerful testimony. One day we're going to record it and um, have it on the screen. But a powerful testimony through that family. But the experience they go through, they'll be able to use to help other people. And that's what they want to do. Our hurts and our habits and our hang-ups cannot become a badge of courage but then our recovery, our rescue, our redemption cannot be hidden from other people. There's a great story in the Bible in Genesis, the story of Joseph. He was so mistreated. People did so many bad things to Joseph. And he was a good guy. He didn't deserve any of the pain in his life. But one day all of his 11 brothers decided to get together. And they ganged up against him and they sold him into slavery. All because of jealousy. And when they went back home, they even had a cloak covered in blood, and they said to their father, oh, he was eaten by a lion. That's a pretty dysfunctional family. And then he was sold into slavery, taken to Egypt, and there he became a slave in a household, and then the master's wife tries to seduce him. He's trying to keep his nose clean. He says, 
I will live a pure life because of God. But then the, the master's wife tries to seduce him and he says, no, no, that's not the right thing to do. So she cries rape and then he's falsely accused of rape and thrown into prison. This is a very much a downhill story all the way for Joseph. But God knew exactly what he was doing. He put him in a position where he eventually ended up becoming the second in command in Egypt. And it was God that used him to save not one, but two nations from destruction and from famine. And later his brothers came to get food, expecting to have their heads cut off. And he said to them in Genesis 50, 20, they intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. God's bigger than the people that can hurt you. No matter what other people have done to you, God can turn that around for good. God never wastes a hurt, but we can waste a hurt if we don't learn from it and then share it with other people. How can other people be blessed if we don't share the problems that we've been having? They might not hear it anywhere else. They need the encouragement on how we make it through these issues. So the second part of this is how do I use my pain to help other people? How do we do that? Well, step eight is all, all about that. 1 Peter 3.15 is a basis for step eight. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. And do it with gentleness and respect. We need to be prepared on how to give an answer on how we made it in life. How did we recover? How are we going through recovery right now? We need to be prepared. So here's some suggestions. The first thing is to make a full list of the experiences that you've had up to this point. I mean, not every single experience in life, but certainly the big ones. And they could be positive, they could be negative, they could be something that you caused or something that was just peripheral to you that someone else caused. Make a list of these experiences, then you ask, what can I learn from these experiences? What can I learn and how did God help me through these experiences? And if you can't understand it, ask God. Pray to him. Ask for clarity. Say, God, how did you help me through that experience? What was it specifically? And then write it out on paper. Why? Why do we always insist you write stuff out? Well, sometimes thoughts get disentangled when they go from your brain to your hand and then you write them down. They become a lot more clear to understand. But then you ask yourself, who can benefit from hearing this story? Who around me has an experience right now? They could benefit from hearing how I managed to get through that experience. The answer is the people who are going through the same thing right now. Those are the people that can benefit from it. They're going through it right now. They might just be a little bit behind you. And then get ready. Because if you say, I'm available to God. If you turn around to God and say, okay, now I'm available. Be ready. Because God will use you. It's interesting how when you say stuff like that, God will put people right in front of you. We just have to have the eyes to see it. These are the people that need to hear your story. All over the world, people need to hear your story. Sometimes God wants us to take the initiative. In Galatians 6, it says, If someone has overcome by sin, humbly help him to get back on the right path. So you approach people. If they're overtaken with sin and going through something, you should approach them and help them to get back on the right path. But here's the important part. Because next it says, remembering that next time it may be you who is in the wrong. So we don't judge. We just help. Share each other's troubles and problems so, they don't, so that we obey the Lord's command. And that's how that finishes up in that verse. We obey the Lord's command. It's commanded. God doesn't say, it's a good idea if you share your story. He commands it. He just says, do it. If we are believers, we are to share the problems and the troubles that we go through to other people. It is a command. If we're not doing it, then effectively we are disobeying God. So how do we share our story? Well, there's three suggestions on this. God does not want to waste the hurt. He doesn't want to waste the problems you've had. So how do we go about it? We start off by being humble. We're all in the same boat. We're all fellow strugglers in life. When you share your story, when you witness to other people, it's basically one beggar showing another beggar how to find bread. You're not saying, I've got it all together, because we haven't got it all together. We are trying to get it all together. We're on the road to recovery. And as we get it together, we need to be humble and say, we're in, the, we're in this together. But here's what happened to me. The second point is to be real. So be humble and be real. We need to be honest about our hurts. We need to be honest about all of our faults. And that can be really hard sometimes. 
We've seen this modeled by people that tell their testimonies. Some, we've had some in the services here. But every, every Thursday night uh, in Celebrate Recovery, there's people there that will tell their story, either in open group or closed group. And that's a good thing to do, share the story. And it takes real courage to do that. But you've got to be real, and it's got to be complete. I'm grateful to be part of a church family where real people can share real problems and real solutions that they've had in their life without feeling put down or being felt guilty about it. We are committed to maintaining an atmosphere of acceptance in this church. We help other people by being honest about our hurts. Why? Because it helps them to open up. Once you start becoming honest, they will open up in return. The other, the other amazing thing about sharing your story is that it not only gives hope to them, as you've walked through it, it gives hope to them that they will, but it also helps healing. If you're telling the story, it helps you to heal. Every time we tell our, share our story with somebody, we get just a little bit stronger. We heal just a little bit more, and we begin to grow a little bit more. People go to celebrate recovery for the healing because they're in pain. But then they stay at Celebrate Recovery because every time they tell their story, they grow just a little bit more. And it keeps them growing in their life. We don't have to lecture, we just have to share a story. God wants us to be a witness, not a defense attorney. We don't argue anybody into heaven. We don't force anybody into heaven. We just share a story. I want to challenge you to take four steps. The first is, if you have not yet committed your life to Christ... Do it today. Why wait? It would be the greatest tragedy if we went through this whole series talking about the hope that Lord, the Lord offers to us and then not do anything about it. Like stepping across the line, giving your life to Christ. If you haven't done that today or yet, do it today. The second is to write your story out. Take some time to sit down and look at what has God done in my life? The good, the bad, the ugly... And how can I use that to help other people? And who are those people around me? The third is commit yourself to some church family. Commit yourself to church family for support. Attendance is not enough for effective recovery. It takes commitment and it takes relationships. And the best place to find relationships is at the church. Ask God to give you someone, this is the fourth one, ask God to give you somebody that you can share your story with. Ask God to put people in your pathway that, can, that you can help. Share the good news of how God really can make a difference in someone's lives. Show them. This isn't just talk in the Bible. This is reality. This is my life. This is what happened. The world is full of people that need to hear the story. And if we don't tell it, then where are they going to hear it? You may be the only Bible version that somebody will hear. They may never come a hundred yards from a church. You may be the only Bible version they ever hear. They may never hear me speak. They never, may never hear Tim speak. But you have a story that can reach them. And they can identify with that. So God wants to use us. What is a better solution sometimes is that you could be sharing your story with normal people around you, not necessarily people in the church. You can reach out to people that we as a church could never reach because your experience is different than ours. There are two things that we cannot do in heaven. There's plenty of stuff we can do in heaven. We can sing, we can sleep, we can eat, relax, have fun, fellowship with other people. But there's two things you cannot do in heaven. The first one is sin, because it's a perfect place. The other is to tell the good news to people around you. Because in heaven, they've already heard the good news. It's too late. Which of the two reasons do you think God leaves us here on earth for? Well, the moment we step across the line, the moment we become a Christian, isn't it easy to think, well, why don't we just end it now? We just, I've become a Christian, let's just go up to heaven and be done with it. But God leaves us here for a reason. And the reason is the Great Commission. Because at the moment we become a Christian, we become a carrier of the good news. We become a missionary in life. And it's part of our life description, not our job description, it's part of our life description as a Christian. If we claim to be believers, we have to share the good news with other people. The world is far more ready to receive it than often we are ready to give it. There are people that need to hear the story. You don't have to be a biblical genius. This is the great thing about it. You can just say, this is what happened to me. 
You don't have to start the story with all kinds of Bible verses. It's more powerful sometimes to say, I don't know what the verses are. In fact, the verses don't matter right now. This is my story and this is what happened to me. It's personal experience. Nobody can refute it. Nobody can just say, well, it's the Bible. I'm not interested. You can say, no, this is my story. This happened to me. Acts 20.24 20, says, life is worth nothing unless you use it for doing the work assigned by the Lord Jesus. And what is that work? The work is the news, telling the good news about God's mighty love and about God's kindness. There is no greater accomplishment than helping somebody else to find the assurance of heaven. Because when you do that, you, made a, you make a friend for eternity. When we get to heaven, God is going to say, that's great, here you are, this is fantastic. Did you bring anyone along with you? We make a friend for eternity when we share Christ. There is no greater accomplishment than to make sure that somebody's eternity is secured. There's no greater joy. There's no greater satisfaction than helping somebody understand the good news. God wants us to use it. We need to share it. We are made for that purpose. That is the meaning of life. Can you imagine getting into heaven many years from today? Somebody walks up to you in heaven and says, I just want to thank you. And you go, thank me? I don't even know you. And they go, no, but you were one of the people at New Hope Church. You were going there at one point and you were praying and you joined the church. You became a supporter with your gifts and your time and your offering. And through your testimony to the people at New Hope, you helped their ministries. And after you died, the church reached me with, with Jesus Christ. And I'm in heaven because of you. And I just want to thank you. That would be worth it? I think so. I make no apology whatsoever in saying that maybe the most significant thing that we can do with our life is to first give our life to Christ, become part of a New Hope family, get involved in ministry, start sharing your story to help other people, start sharing your experiences. This will far outlast anything that we'll ever do in our career. It will far outlast anything that we'll ever do in our hobbies because we're talking about eternal implications. We're talking about getting people from darkness into light. We're talking about getting people from hell into heaven and getting people to live a life without God to living a life with God. And people will be thanking you for eternity. There is no more significant cause than this. So I challenge you to take the eighth step. I yield myself to be used by God to bring the good news to other people in my example and in my words. In Canada, it's possible to go camping hundreds of miles away from any town or any, any city. And on a cloudy night, the blackness is complete. It's total. You can put your hand three inches in front of your face and you cannot see it at all. But if there's a city nearby, and when I say nearby, I mean within a hundred miles, the, black, the blackness is totally broken. The light from the city is reflected off the clouds. The night that was so black is no longer quite as desolate. And likewise, Christians who let their light shine, let their light shine around other people, cannot be hidden. The good light, the good news, and the good light that they shed around reduces the blackness that otherwise would be complete. The stories of our lives in Christ, the stories of recovery in Christ, are powerful and they need to be told. Why? So that others can see there's hope. When they're going through tough times, they need to see there's hope. People that have been through it and come out the other side. In Psalm 23, it says, even though we go through the valley of death, notice the word through. We're not stuck in it. We're going through it. That means at some point, it will end. The road to recovery is important. And it's important to understand one thing, that the road to recovery starts at the foot of the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this series. We're, we're grateful for um, all the organizations that put together programs to help people with recovery. Lord, help us to see our own pain, to see our own issues, to, to be able to break them down in our mind, to write them down on paper, to be able to understand the, the things that we've been through so that we can use those experiences to help others. And Lord, please open our eyes to see the people around us that need that. Lord, give us courage to share our story. Give us courage to, to help other people understand that our experience, that our knowledge is valuable to helping them getting through the pain that they're going through at that time. We thank you for the biblical um, examples of this. 
And we're, as always, we thank you for your word as it guides us in everything that we need. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great day, everybody.